welcome to this podcast series from the School of Teacher Education at Charles Sturt University, Australia. Hello, wonderful people. Uh, my name is Tara Brabazon, for our non-faculty of education colleagues. <laughs> I'm the Professor of Education, the head of the School of Teacher Education, and it's my great pleasure to welcome Charles Sturt University colleagues and our podcast listeners to our School of Teacher Education seminar series. Now, when we refreshed this series for 2015, we focused on increasing the diversity of modes and forms of scholarship that we express in these sessions. So today is our first panel presentation of emerging research that is yet to be published. But before I introduce the topic, let me introduce the people. Our guest to Charles Sturt University today is Dr. Leanne McRae. Leanne is a lecturer in internet studies at Curtin University in Western Australia. She's also worked at Murdoch University, Edith Cowan University and PIBT. She is an outstanding teacher, one of the most outstanding teachers I've ever seen and she's just shy of 30 referee publications in her career so far. She's published in such extraordinary publications as Fast Capitalism, Transformations and the truly fabulous Bad Subjects. The book we're discussing today is her first monograph. The other member of the panel is a certain gentleman by the name of Professor Steve Redhead, currently the Professor of Jurisprudence and Head of our new law degree being formed at CSU. He's worked in the UK for much of his career, particularly Manchester and Brighton, and had multiple sojourns to Canada. He worked in Australia 10 years ago at Murdoch University as a professor before coming to CSU two years ago. His previous roles have included directorships of large research centres, including the Unit for Law and Popular Culture and the Manchester Institute for Popular Culture. He's been Associate Dean of Research, Director of Research, Sub-Dean of Graduate Studies at this university and Director of Research at MMU. He's published 16 books and hundreds of articles. His best-known books probably are Rave Off, End of the Century Party, We've Never Been Postmodern, and his monographs on Virilio and Baudrillard. His new book, Shortly to Appear for Rutledge, is titled This Modern Sporting Life and appears in August this year. So the book we're discussing today is his 17th title. So I'm structuring the presentation today, the panel, around 10 questions to Steve and Leanne, and there'll be plenty of time for questions at the end, but I would ask, considering we have a colleague here who's been on a red eye all night, if we could do the 10 questions first and then have the questions at the end from the audience, I'd really appreciate that. But what I will do is provide a short introduction now. This presentation is titled Moving On Up, Physical Cultural Studies in Third Tier Cities. So I'll be presenting a standalone seminar later on in this session on third tier cities but let me do a truncated version now urban planners urban theorists city imaging research cultural policy and creative industry scholars often split cities into three tiers global second tier and third tier Global cities are most famously studied by Saskia Sassen. They are globalising cities and categorised by sameness. So finance, capitalism and corporation headquarters are located in these cities. People and money move between them. They are the archetype of John Urry's work on mobility and Scott Lash's investigation of risk and modernities. And since September 11, global cities are also the focus of both terrorism and terrorism studies. Second tier cities are the non-capital cities of their nations defined relationally off global cities. The key book in this field emerged in 1999 by Marcus and et al. And since then, studies have focused on specific second tier cities. So Manchester, Alexandria, Liverpool, Melbourne, Osaka, and of course Perth in Western Australia for the West Australians here. So these cities gained the advantages of aggregation of services, particularly to health, to education and a diverse workforce. They often show an interesting immigration history and spikes in fame, of which Liverpool and the Beatles, Manchester and Acid House and Seattle and Grunge provide the archetypes. 
The third tiers are the small cities and large towns. They are deeply neglected in the research literature. Some articles emerged in that cusp before September 11, particularly 1999 to 2001. The event management literature in tourism does investigate them, and perhaps the most famous book came from David Bell and Mark Jane in 2006, Small Cities, Urban Experience beyond the metropolis. Now, they are neglected in the research literature because they're not only invisible, they also happen to be troubled. They are, if you will, edge lands, confronting a lack of stable and diverse employment. So this panel presentation captures the last stages of a book that we're writing on movement cultures in third-tier cities. In 2013, I edited a book titled City Imaging, and Leanne had two chapters in there. Unique Urbanity appeared in December 2014. But this book that we're discussing today has an even longer heritage, and for our Burlington colleagues, it is a Canadian heritage. We worked at the University of Ontario and we wrote an SSHRC grant on mobility in third-tier cities. And we left Canada before we could complete the project. So in 2012, since 2012, I've had 30,000 words sitting on my hard drive. But, si but since 2012, physical cultural studies started to emerge as a field. And Leanne's work on mobility, movement and policy was emerging at the same time. So we decided to align these projects and create Moving On Up. And this book is about six to eight weeks, about I think, about to be a completed draft, depending on how many early mornings I can pinch. But it is my pleasure from this background to welcome Leanne and Steve and work through the ten emergent questions about this research, the research project and the book. So Steve, let's start with the disciplinary, nay, interdisciplinary question. What is physical cultural studies? Yes, that's a very good question. And I'm really interested in the way that labels in academia get um, started and how they die as well. I suppose I've been involved in quite a few myself. But this one particularly started as a replacement for sociology of sport and leisure, basically. Um, so a lot of the work that I did when I first came as uh, head of the School of Human Movement Studies, for example, with various colleagues there, and we, Tara and I actually started a physical cultural studies uh, research group um, amongst a few of our colleagues. I think it's, it's now starting to literally replace, say, the School of Human Movement Studies as a as a name around the world, Physical Cultural Studies Department at University of Bath, which is there, uh, is a really good example. It used to be, you know, Human Movement Studies or something similar. Um, Physical Cultural Studies has actually replaced it. One of the people there uh, on that slide is Michael Silk, uh, S-I-L-K. I don't know if people have come across him. He's a very good academic. And he's the head of that. And he's actually an editor, along with David Andrews and a very good New Zealand scholar called Holly Thorpe. I don't know if people have come across those people. Really, really good. They're editing... Silk, Andrews and Thorpe are editing a Routledge handbook of physical cultural studies. And I happen to be the reviewer for that project um, about nine months ago. And I realised what a huge domain this is and a reorganisation of everything from, say, the um, work that... Tara's organising with SOAP colleagues, the wonderful playbook, for example, all the way through to what used to be the sociology of sport and leisure. So it covers a whole range of things, range of things um, that Joe and uh, Bill have been involved in, say, body in the classroom and that sort of work, body in society. It covers all of those areas as a, if you like, a new discipline. And physical cultural studies is the, the name, PCS is the um, the acronym, you know, it's the thing for sure. But I think what's interesting is that it's so recent, only about six years ago, Sociology of Sport Journal had a special issue, uh, it's North American Journal, which is very good, Sociology of Sport, had a special issue on physical cultural studies, and it started to get attraction. And I say, I, School of Human Movement Studies hasn't had its name changed here, but actually around, I'm told Frank, but actually around the world, um, no, we did talk about um, around the world that is happening. Now, maybe it's just um, 
window dressing. I don't think it is in this particular case. I think it's actually suggesting that, say, the old sociology of sport and leisure wasn't really very sociological. A lot of it was actually cultural studies, which I think is very interesting, and I think we should be bringing that back in. But also that the areas covered you know, weren't just you know, the traditional I don't know, sociology or rugby or whatever. Actually, there's a lot more in this leisure, play, um, the body, which we should be re-theorising. I think it's what, that's what physical culture yeah. studies does. And Steve, you did raise the cultural <coughs> studies issue, so I will raise a question for both of you. I think the three of us are best known for our work in cultural studies together and apart, but Steve is currently in law, Leanne is currently in internet studies, and I'm currently in education. So the bottom line question is, I suppose, what the hell has happened to cultural studies. Leanne, do you want to kick us off, Dad? Yeah, I don't really know what they were thinking with me in <laughs> internet studies. Um, <laughs> but, yeah, this is a really evocative question. And when you, I saw that um, you put, put Graham Turner's book in there, which I read, read some time ago, I went back to revisit my notes and printed them out, and they're here, um, to, you know, because it's such an important kind of um, perspective that he takes and that... Uh, cultural, I think cultural studies kind of had a hostile takeover and Graham Turner interprets that as part of its success you know that the reason why everyone fell in love with um, cultural studies so they wanted it for themselves and so they, they, they stripped out the good bits out of it as you would and, um, and, and what I think ha- well you know I think there has been a you know, the, the cool bits of cultural studies, particularly the popular cultural studies stuff, has basically been appropriated and sucked up by anything from English literature through to history through to sociology. And they kind of go, here's a, you know, if, if we're selling something to students, it's like, here's a course on this, and hey, we've got some cool text that you can look at in the meantime, and look how groovy this is, look how history is now rebranding itself as, you know, cool and you know we can look at historical texts in a different way and you know research in a different way so I think cultural studies in its ethic of borrowing kind of rebounded back onto it (laughs) and 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 I think I think a lot of cultural studies academics let let allowed that to happen to us to a certain degree and I'm you know I'm don't not going to single anybody mm-hmm. out as well, a result we, we, of that. We were certainly present, literally present, yeah. when cultural studies at Murdoch exploded or indeed imploded. Mm-hmm. We were there when it happened. Mm-hmm. So, Steve, are you reading this as a retraction back to the disciplines or, as Leanne said, it shows the success of the work that we did? I, I think there is a retraction back to the disciplines, which is why mm-hmm. I think physical cultural studies as a label is really interesting. And as someone who's wanted to smash the disciplinary background... Um, as much as I possibly could in my career, you know, I think it's regrettable that we're going back to the core disciplines. Mm. But maybe that's what happens in hard times, you know, conservative yeah. times, which I certainly think we are in since 9-11. Um, and the trouble is that you go back to what you know, and I think the really interesting thing about culture studies when it developed, certainly at the original Birmingham Centre and then at our Manchester Institute for Popular Culture Centre in Manchester, um, I think we were trying to do something different and all sorts of problems existed as a result of that. But I think we were trying to dance on the edge of the discipline. And I think we've forgotten how to do that. Mm. And I'd like us to be able to do it again. Physical culture studies is a good example of maybe regenerating things. And, uh, you know, I think we need that. And also I love the metaphor of dancing on the edge of a discipline in terms of physical cultural studies. That metaphor is working incredibly well. (laughs) Steve, if I can move you now to the other element of this discussion, and that is you were involved in in this Culture of Cities project in the 1990s, particularly investigating the relationship between second-tier cities, and your particular area of interest was Montreal and Manchester. What was the goal of this project, and what was the place of sport within that and how it has carried forward? I think it was a wonderful project to be involved in. It was in the late 90s and actually finished about 2005. And it was SHRC, which is SSHRC, Social Science Humanities Research Council of Canada, like RAARC. Um, and SHRC funded basically, like, it off, like ARC very often do in this country, uh, you know, the 
the elite universities. So McGill in Montreal was a leader of this project, which was great. Uh, York University in Toronto, which I'm, a, where I'm a, also a professor at the moment, I'm a professor. Um, York was very much part of it. But what they, they did, as Canadians, they said, oh, well, let's open it up to Europeans. So they were looking at Toronto and Montreal, and they said, oh, let's get a few Europeans. So they had Dublin, uh, Berlin, and Manchester, and we were the Manchester people. So I was a visiting professor on that project for about six years. And uh, apart from allowing you to go to wonderful cities like Montreal, it was actually an interesting project because the culture of cities thing was a bit of a physical culture studies thing before physical culture studies. So the colleagues, and we had a lot of postgrads as well as, um, as staff members, uh, in different disciplines all over the place, basically looking at these different aspects of these two cities in Canada and then comparing to the European stuff. And because we'd done a lot of work on popular culture, popular music, but also sport, and they thought that was a bit of an anathema, actually, um, we, we kind of went into this great culture cities project. Um, and it, it had lots of publications, but it kind of petered out in the end, which I thought was interesting. There was a lot of good work there, but you felt that the energy was kind of going, partly through this lack of dancing on the edge. I think it danced on the edge to start with, and then people started to get um, to go back inside the disciplines. And I think that's what happened. But I thought as a, as a spark of energy for a long while, this was a really interesting interdisciplinary project. And it's the sort of thing we might do again. You know, it seems to me we should be doing these sorts of things Indeed. in Australia. It would be great. And it also demonstrated the courage of funding bodies at that time yeah. that they were prepared to go to the interdisciplinary area with yeah. courage. And I'm not sure if these funding bodies are still prepared to do that. Yeah. So yeah. let's continue, if we can, on that movement issue. And Steve and Leanne... What do you think are the benefits of talking about movement cultures rather than organised sport, particularly when we're talking about third-tier cities? So, Leanne, do you want to kick us off? Um, I think there's tremendous benefit. I think that when I think organised sport, I think team sport. Or, mm. you know, and, you know, of course, there may be two different things happening there. So that's an important distinction to remember. But my brain goes to team sports. Yes. And, and team sports, for me, are very conservative and are yeah. built around a nation-building public culture uh, type of rendering. And I think if we, if the, when I look at the word or the phrase movement cultures, plural, I think that there is a way to see bodies moving in different ways, not locked into those archetypal and archaic ways of understanding physicality mm. as ne only locked into health, necessarily. That it can mean multiple things <coughs> and that it also allows different types of bodies because organised sport create, you know, has this very narrow rendering of what bodies are allowed to play sport in a public space at a particular time. And movement cultures, it creates multiple space, space for multiple types of bodies to move in a variety of ways. And I yeah. think that's a potential strength here. Yeah. And well, I think so very often um, team sports are rendered male, masculine. It's interesting as part of that um, physical cultural studies uh, research group that we set up here. <coughs> Excuse me, Chelsea Litchfield and I just wrote an article on um, uh, the way that, particularly in Australia, those sorts of in team sports are rendered male and the, the um, females in those sorts of sports are rendered invisible. I think it's a real process there, which particularly goes on in Australia, and we should criticise. But I think the movement studies thing is interesting partly in this more general reconfiguring of disciplines. I think that it's part of mobility studies. You mentioned mobility. Someone like John Urry, who was a s traditional sociologist in Britain in the, in the 2000s, basically set up a journal called Mobilities. I don't know if people have come across that. And also the Centre for Mobilities Research, Seymour, is the acronym, at the University of Lancaster. So Urry and his colleagues have completely changed sociology to being basically a sociology of mobilities, um, and his book, 
I mean, the journal Mobility is well worth looking at, and again, for all sorts of disciplines, from education through to sociology, but really, really good. So I think movement studies is part of that. And that also, you know, a lot of their work is interesting because it's looking at technology and the digital. Yes. Um, so I, I think the idea of, you know, what he would call sociology of mobilities is really important part of this. Look, and we will continue to go there because a lot of it is about, you know, we've talked about walking cultures and yep. so forth and also Mike Kent, our, our great colleague, is arriving mm. shortly and he focuses yes. very much on ableism yes. and the different ways that bodies move on legs or on wheels or how they move and so that's quite important. But there is a key trajectory that is emerging in physical cultural studies and it's an important, I think, plat in this conversation and that's mm. the, the quantified self. Mm. of which physical and self-monitoring cultures are a part of this. So basically this explains, if you will, why Fitbit has mm. suddenly entered popular <laughs> culture. So it details the measurement of movement in analogue life and then how it is digitised and assessed via an array of interfaces and applications. So do you think that these type of Fitbit interfaces offer that great positive encouragement or is it a form of self-surveillance, nay, a new form of commodified self? Do you want to kick us off, Nan? Well, I've got mine on. And I, I haven't. <laughs> I've, I've, I've only got three lights so far today. I'm, just, I'm not quite getting to my 10,000, I don't think. Okay, so, um, the, I thought this was a really interesting question because I've talked to a number of people about this because I'm relatively new to the Fitbit and I mainly got on board because... Tara was doing work on it and another colleague back in Western Australia is also doing work on it so I thought I'll help the team out and contribute my data to their projects. I, On a personal perspective first, I found it very, very useful. I, so I'm surprised at how useful I found it because um, I've always thought, I've always been a very active quite an active person and all of a sudden I kind of am not an active person <laughs> and it's kind of it's been a really interesting kind of different perspective on how I move through my day and also when I choose to move and how I move and we've also conversed a little bit about what it tracks and what it doesn't track so that's a, another conversation but so the, in terms of sub, I think there are some real problems in terms of surveillance here I think this is a surveillance on the body in time in space which is in the age of post Snowden mm. is something to really be thinking about and to be uh, to be you know even something as simple as that what consequence does this have for health insurance for example you know if this data is available to be sold mm. off to you know I mean, I admit I haven't read the Fitbit terms of service. Do they, you know, do they have the right to sell off my data? I'm sure they do. Yes. Um, so, you know, and we've got all the and the page. It's kind of interesting as well about what they ask you to put in. You like your height and your weight and all this. Kind of, so there's an interesting kind of privacy kind of intrusion kind of thing happening there, which but you I, have consented to. Yes, exactly. Mm -hmm. But I also think. And I've, uh, I did speak to an, a student about this, and she pointed out to me quite accurately that those people who are already involved in fitness are already counting their steps, their their reps, their kilometres, their their calories. They're already doing that. So the question the now the thing, issue is is making that process digitised and where that goes to third parties. And I think there is a really important conversation to be had. Very there. well said, Steve. Do you see this as linked in with some of the work we've been doing on capitalism and the commodified self? What's your position on this as someone who is on this panel not wearing a Fitbit? Yes. Um, no, I think, it's, I think the idea of monitoring the self and, in fact, you know, recreating the self is really interesting. Um, I think it's part of the Internet of Things, which mm. is really interesting too, this idea of um, how the internet of the future, the digital of the future isn't going to be just subjects, it's going to be objects, so bananas are going to be connected <laughs> to each other and to us, um, not just you know, individual subjects. So I, th I think it's part of that, but it's also um, part of, I mean, you, 
you know, Australia's talking at the moment about metadata, data retention legislation and all this sort of thing. We really, you know, we're sleepwalking into, a, into the dark, a, a new dark ages in my view. And then we have to be really, really careful. But Fitbits are interesting. Right, well, on that depressive <laughs> note, let's, let's continue on the sort of negative slide before we pull this back and we all have to be medicated. But let's go to the negative for a moment. Let's enfold that city question back in here. And again, to our colleagues in Dubbo, this is quite a resonant one for us as well. What particular challenges in infrastructure <coughs> for health and for well-being emerge in these small cities that we don't see in the second tier and the global city? And Steve, we'll start with you. So in the small cities, what particular specific infrastructural issues do we see? Um, I think one of the things... I mean, you know, Bathurst is a yeah. small city and having lived here two and a half years really happily, you know, I, I, look, I used to be a city boy and now I'm a country boy for some reason, but I actually do really like where we're living. Um, but I th I've seen in that period, uh, so manufacturing industry going down the pan, basically, and that could be you know, mining or it could be manufacturing of dog food or whatever, but I think we're in a really serious post-industrial Australia edge, and I think Bath is a good example of that. The thing is that images, and particularly images of you know a 200-year-old city, uh, in some ways, all that we've got left, and that's a, uh, a symbol, actually, of where um, the sort of society we now have, which I say, I think, is sliding into all sorts of problems uh, globally. I think in Australia, small cities are in, a, a, they're at an edge, they are at an edge, because if they don't remodel themselves and remanufacture themselves, particularly around the knowledge economy, we go back to Fitbit, um, we are in trouble. Um, and I think that's why a university city like this, an educational city in your terms, is actually really, really important. That knowledge economy, we've got to stop thinking about that as a phrase and somehow mm -hmm. embed it. Um, and I don't, I don't think that's easy, but I think we have to do that for yeah. the survival in the university. A university like CSU is incredibly important. Absolutely. In that, and, and in Dubbo and orange and so on. Absolutely. And Leanne, are you as depressed as our northern friend? Oh, well, Steve and I share, <laughs> yes, a, a fond depression <laughs> with each other. Um, and no, I think that's really, you know, I pondered this question actually quite some time. <laughs> and I think, yeah, I think that we have to take the knowledge economy seriously. And I think Part of the way we take that seriously, and there's, this is just one small fragment that really resonated with me, is thinking about how you manage a fluid ethic within a small city. Mm. That there is actually a great deal of fluidity in terms of how you think about regionality and space. In terms of most small cities are surrounded by a significant rural population. Mm. And having to take into account how to engage a rural population, how do you construct for a rural population versus a more urbanised population, how you mesh those two approaches, how you create a fluid infrastructure that can harness the potential in those different areas, I think, is very important. Mm. And spoken like an Albany girl who now lives in Perth. <laughs> very well said. So therefore, again, moving now as we're reaching our final stage of the seminar to a more optimistic future, do you think there are some digital fitness solutions that can manage some of these analogue challenges in third tier cities? Stephen. Well, I think in the sort of studies that particularly Leanne did for our book, um, I think there are. And one of the interesting things is how even though I'm painting myself as a depressed northern English person, I do think there are, I am sometimes quite optimistic about things. And I think these are the sort of studies that Leanne did for us for the book, and we're trying to contextualise these, actually suggest that there are things you can do locally. And one of the things is actually to, to create um, sort of, not necessarily new creative industries, but this is actually breathing life into creative industries, I think. Creative industries, as a phrase, has started to lose its uh, gloss, but actually this is a way of, particularly through what we're saying is physical cultural studies, is actually to say what can be done within these sorts of 
place is the local initiatives that we've got in the book are really, really interesting for fitness, for individual prosperity and so on. So I think I am quite optimistic having looked at these studies. Before we ask the case study question, then, have you got a, a vibe on this? Yeah, I always get really worried. Yeah, you do. <laughs> when I, with these types <clears> of <throat> things, because my initial rebellious cultural studies instinct <laughs> is to go, is to get really tense whenever anybody suggests a digital solution. Because it's always like, you know, something's tough, we don't know how to solve a problem. Hey, let's digitise it. You know, you know, we don't have the money or we don't want to spend the money. Hey, let's digitise it. And, of course, you confront, as we all know, those there are huge issues with this about accessibility, about literacy, about how you, how you move through, you know, how are you active in public spaces and how that interfaces with a digital infrastructure as well. And, again, about going back to those questions of surveillance and, 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 and movement in that way. But one of the positives that did come out, of, as Steve mm. says, of the case studies I did mm. do for the book was Wonderful. some really interesting stuff happening in New Zealand yeah. and in other places in the world with the use of apps, the use mm. of, of, mm. of, you know, you know pod- pedometers, not just yep. bit bits. Yep. Geosocial networking. Yeah, you know, yep. These types of things of inspiring or creating a community of activity. And I think there's merit in that. Yeah. Yeah. And I think the thing is that there are, you know, the digital gets um, split into, you know, you are for the digital mm. because it's you know, utopian, or you're against it because there are, you know, really dark um, aspects of it, paedophilia and whatever. And I think both of those things are true. The trouble is that we've, you know, got into camps around what the digital is. And I, um, one of the books that you ordered for us recently was a book by Deborah Lupton, who used to be at CSU and is now at the University of Canberra, but she'd written a very good book called Digital Sociology, which I turned my nose up when it came through Amazon. But actually, I really enjoyed it. And it reflected on the sort of things that Leanne was talking about, trying to, again, a bit like Uri's work on mobilities, trying to reconfigure sociology in a digital age. And after all, digital age is so new, you know, how... How, how long have we been on Twitter, for example, four or five years? And I think that it's quite difficult to reflect on something that is actually so new yeah. and that we are so fearful about mm-hmm. um, or so overly optimistic. Well, you see, I would argue the exact opposite. The internet is as old as I am, so that's close to death, right? Yeah. So the thing is, therefore, it is a mature medium. And my argument against you two would be the digital has now fragmented and can be customised. It is a pick and mix bag. So geosocial networking, such as through apps, through places that know where you are, QR codes on food that can sell oranges from orange, are incredibly useful. So it's now such a mature medium, we can pick and mix a bit more. And Mm. therefore, let's get into Leanne's case study. Wonderful. So Leanne, you looked at many small cities and the book is fascinating on this, but two of the case studies you really fo- focused on, with great respect to our Kiwis in our department as well, <laughs> included Palmerston North and Albany to look at their cycling programs for tourists and for residents. So what was the success of these programs? Did they work by your analysis? I th- cannot give you an answer to that because I think it's still in progress I think they're still working it out Albany definitely is still in its process of actually constructing its cycling infrastructure they haven't even gotten to the you know the education part the promote you know the full on promotional part and actually activating it more thoroughly within the community Palmerston North also is still um, you know their use of digitization in particular is really interesting i actually think they could do more with it but i'm not on their council obviously <laughs> um so i think both of those projects are really um in process but i think what both of the what i liked about both of them was firstly the ambition the, amb- the ambition of albany in particular they have just decided they're going to be a cycling capital of the country which, you know, go for it, man, you know, <laughs> that's awesome. And what I liked about Palmerston North's approach was the elegance of it, the nuance of it, that it was thought through, it wasn't just stuck within a local government policy, this is what we have money for, this is what we've done in the past, this, you know, 
is we're a rugby nation, so we'll build more, you know, <laughs> rugby fields for everyone. It was really about thinking about how do we engage people in activity on multiple levels. This idea of move, a movement, movement culture, yeah. you know, not just a, on a particular sport, <clears throat> but just getting out, getting out of the house, you know, yes. moving around. And I think that's what both of them do really quite well is that they do mesh this idea or are attempting to mesh the idea of the rural and the urban a little bit, no, that they're actually trying to create pathways and uh, you know, literal and metaphorical pathways. And very, very well said. Let's get to an issue, I think, that has profound challenges for a Bathurst, for an Orange, for a Dubbo as well, and also, should I say, Wagga. So do you both believe that there is a difference between marketing active tourism for visitors and improving the health and well-being for residents? So how do we balance the livability of these small cities with the excitement of an active tourism? So can the same policies and the same infrastructure operate for both visitors and residents? Steve, do you want to kick off? I think it is a really difficult policy question. When we were doing our work in Manchester over a long period, um, we were trying to um, make sustainable what was a really deindustrializing, ugly, you know, post-industrial city, basically. And I think we're, we're going to have to start to deal with those sorts of issues in Australia um, in the future because of my argument about post-industrial Australia. But Manchester was a great example of it. I had a huge um, period as an industrial city. And then it started to make its image through sport or popular culture, popular music. And yet, you know, a few hundred yards from the city centre where these things were happening were some of the most um, poverty-stricken estates on the planet. And, you know, they were slum cities, really, as Mike Davis calls them. But actually, I think it's, it's a very difficult policy balance. I'm not sure at all how easy it is to do. But I think you do have to do it because the residents are as important as the visitors. Indeed. Leanne? Yeah, this was the toughest question on yeah. the, of the ten, yeah. and I pondered this a lot, <laughs> because it was certainly a gap in the research that I did, and I actually got quite frustrated, because I actually literally was asking <clears throat> people directly, like, how are you thinking about tourism and health here? <clears throat> and they had no answers for me. And the closest we got was a, a, a guy called Murray Gom, who was the president of the Albany Bicycle User Group. Mm. And he basically was just kind of like, oh, build it and they will come, you know, type of thing. That was his kind of like, yeah, it, as long as we've got the infrastructure, it doesn't matter how they're using it. Or we don't, you know, we just want the, the bicycle track on in place. So it's, I think Steve has hit it as close as you can get it. You, you do have to make it work. and I, mm. But I think, I think there's going to be overlap. I think you do have to have separate policy because I think the motivation is very, very different because you have adventure tourists who are going to want uh, to, you know, abseil off the cliff, but you also want the local population to be able to cycle gently around the edge of the cliff yes. and look out over the ocean and, yeah. you know, and that's something that has to be balanced yeah. and I'm not quite sure how no. They're going to do that. No. This is a really hub or a nub of knowledge because <coughs> I think two, three weeks ago I was speaking at the New South Wales mm. Tourism Association. I presented this as a challenge and possible policy scenarios to get out of it and the room was riveted and stated that this is solving some of their problems. So this is a problem for councils in our region yep. right now. Last question, obviously optimistic. Uh, are you both relatively optimistic about, I'll use the dreaded word, about well-being cultures and movement cultures in third-tier cities, considering how profoundly these cities were impacted and are still impacted by the global financial crisis? I've always argued third-tier cities operate at the mono-industrial edge of capitalism, so they're most impacted by the vagaries of capitalism. What would you like to say about the GFC? Um, well, I think in Australia, you know, whatever you think of their politics, people like Rudd and Gillard were able to um, put a break on the effects of the global financial crisis. Living in Europe as we were at the time, uh, you could see you know, whole sovereign nations like Greece, like Spain and so on, and mind small cities in those, going down the pan. If you look at the kind of um, the situation of 
of some of those countries with incredibly high youth unemployment and so on. You know, it's, we're almost putting our fingers in the dike when we're talking about these sorts of things. But I do think they're important. I just think that my pessimism comes from what I think will be a post-industrial Australia. I think global financial crisis is now really hitting. And uh, I think the sort of effects that we see in universities and uh, and our, our education generally, actually, in Australia is are starting to hit and will be a, a long time coming. Um, so I think there is, you know, I am optimistic in the sense that local projects are really, really important, but I'm also pessimistic about what I see as a, in the dark ages, really. I think it's not just an economic thing. I think it's actually, it's like a wave. It's like a tsunami. And you could see it in Europe. It'll ha- hit in other places, Australia has kept out of that for all sorts of good reasons, and I think now the dike has broken, basically. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm actually positive for a change. <laughs> Sorry, Steve. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, no, I think... I, yeah, look, I, I say that from the perspective of having lived in Australia to mm. the GFC, and yeah. that's a very comfortable, privileged yes. position to be speaking I from. Um, you know, I hadn't seen the horror, mm. you know. So, but why I am optimistic is because of the case studies that I did mm. for the book, and also in my Fitbit daily mm. life mm. as well. Because through those mechanisms, both of those mechanisms, I have been able to see the energy and the commitment of local council, local government, local people to community interest and to making things better. And it sounds really naive when I say that out loud, but it's true. And Mm. this is a silly story, but when I go on my walk to get my steps up, I walk down to this park and on the way, there's a sign on a bin that says, call us today for a free tree. You can ring up the council and they'll come and plant a free tree for you. Now, that, I mean, it's silly, but it's awesome. Yeah. I mean, it, it, but these little things that, you know, councils will do for their, their members, for their constituents. And, you know, like the, the, the case study in Canada that I did where mm. for 15 bucks for a fortnight, you can hire a piece of equipment to take somebody who's disabled out and do outdoor activity in the snow. I mean, that's the type, you know, that's the type of energy that I was seeing. Now the question then becomes if, you know, they run out of money, they need to have the same amount of energy devoted to their fiscal solutions and whether they can find those fiscal solutions and how what impact that will have on the the outlook and energy and the positivity of those people who are actually being proactive in that way. Well, that was a very positive ending, and you've certainly convinced me. We've got some great time for questions, so thank you for hanging with us. We will go to Dubbo first. Now, Dubbo, we can't see you, so Anne, I'm going to put you in charge of the Dubbo room. Anne, any questions you're in, darling? Uh, I I have a question. Go, Anne. (laughs) My question is, really, when we get to this point of looking at um, how we can facilitate or work with what is in, within the community. What then is the process of, of us as um, academics and educators to support this in our in our culture in our in our community? Mm-hmm. Uh, that's a great question. I'll do the first answer, and to answer it, I'll go back to Dick Hebditch, which is quite <laughs> interesting in terms of the cultural studies conversation we had. And what I would say is when Dick Hebdige wrote about punk in the book Subculture, he wrote about it for the future. So whenever anybody now thinks about punk, it's the Dick Hebdige version of punk that we summon. So an academic was actually, through his writing, able to construct the punk that we now know as much as through the Sex Pistols. So what I would say is through the work we are doing, writing to the present and writing to the future, we are connecting the dots through this type of research that we're doing. 
Creative Industries at its best, city imaging work at its best, takes cultural modelling and city modelling from around the world, looks at Albany, looks at Palmerston North, looks at Bolton, and says to Dubbo Council, guys, these options have worked elsewhere, they may not work here, but here are some already existing models for you to think about. So it saves time, it saves money, and this is the public work that we should be doing in universities. Yeah, I agree. I think we should... Thanks, Sam, for the question. I think we should, as academics... I think I would see academics as public intellectuals who should be doing their jobs, but they should also have a broader view, which is part of the community, which is why I, I think um, universities like CSU are really important. They see part of their mission as being part of the community. And what I would say is, uh, in, in again, what I think are dark times... You know, rural justice, indigenous justice, for example, is an extremely important part of all of this, which is why what Leanne said about the local and local politics is important. But we have a, we have a duty, I think, not just a role uh, to be involved in it. That can be in all sorts of ways. It could be consultancy work. Tor and I have done some work for you know, Bathurst Regional Council, partly because we have done this work elsewhere, and Bathurst say, yes, this is really interesting. You know, we can, we can use, we can run with it. Yeah, um, yeah, really cool, awesome question. Um, I think it's really important to really operate and work and activate the bridges that exist within these kind of new areas, like the digital sociologies and the physical yep. cultural studies that we're talking about, and to not forget the heritage of cultural studies in that, not to eulogise it and not to mythologise it, not to make it nostalgic, but to recognise the tools that were there. Yeah that enable us to make these connections and to, con and to use that as a language to make those connections. Very well said. We'll come back to the Dubbo Room if anyone... Oh, Anne, have you got a follow-up, darling? No, thank you so much, guys. Really appreciate it. That was a fantastic question, Dal. We'll come to the Bathurst Room. Who'd like to have first pick? Very quick one. First, I, I do have comments and thoughts about this that I'd like to share, but... Um, go on. First is, uh, where, was the, where were the free trees? Free trees, <laughs> literally yeah. on my walk. To that, no, no, but which city? In Perth. In Perth. Oh. I, I, the reason I ask is sort of is that that it sounded to me like a first city, first city phenomenon, not a third yes. city phenomenon. Yes. Yes. And yes. It just does. Yes. And, and I, I, when when you first introduced this concept, which <clears throat> you've awakened in me something that was kind of there, but I, I, I now have a few more words with yes. which to describe. Yeah. Things that I've been feeling, which, yes. is, which is which is one of the wonderful things about these seminars. Yes. Yeah. Um, but it's the, one of the first things that I thought when you introduced this topic was a theme of conservatism in third tier cities, and mm. Mm. I, I made a note of it. Is, 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 is this? Would you characterise third tier cities as as conservative first of all? And then you started to, I think, address this when you suggested that. You know, you were talking. You, know, you were using the language of infrastructure, but how do we create an infrastructure mm -hmm. in third-tier cities, which deals with the regional mm -hmm. as well, yes. the regional, the rural as well? Yes. Is, is this? Uh, is I'm, this I'm, I'm happy. To, I'm happy to go first on mm -hmm. this one again too. Uh, when you're talking about conservatism, I I nodded aggressively because where I have seen the conservatism in third-tier cities around the world is in local government structures. So the separation of building from culture, for example, infrastructure from the arts, that is a sign that a, a council is not fit for purpose because you need to be connecting up infrastructure with culture. And in second-tier cities, that connective work has been done particularly strongly. In global cities, the massive scale tends to create pollution and environmental concerns which take it away. So I think that connectivity happens best in second-tier cities, of which Manchester, Seattle and Sheffield were great mm -hmm. examples. So the conservatism comes structurally from the council. And what makes Bathurst so interesting in the work that Steve and I have been doing with the, with the Mayor, who we have enormous respect for, Gary Rush, is he is aware that his infrastructure is not fit for purpose. He is aware his configuration of culture and the arts is not fit for purpose. It is too conservative. It is a high cultural, indeed a petty bourgeois version of culture that is not serving a modern Bathurst. So the conservatism, can I say Dubbo is different? Dubbo has a recreation policy and has connected up 
people, culture and infrastructure. So Dubbo is ahead of Bathurst. But I'll throw it over to you two. I just agree with that. Yeah, absolutely, Anne. Totally agree. No, I think your question is really interesting because, of course, what you're trying to do is be interventionist. It's interesting that you mentioned Gary, Gary Rush. He came to our, the launch of our regional, well, Creative Regions Lab last year and he, he sat in to Justin O'Connor, he used to work with me in Manchester for about 20 minutes and after that his head exploded because he could see, because Professor O'Connor actually set out you know, the, the, the strategy, he could see that it could be really useful to his um, to his council and he, to give him his, his credit, you, you may see you know, liberal as conservative but the, the point is that he was actually modernising and he has modernised. I think it's really interesting. So, um, you know, conservatism with a small c might be how you see it, but actually I think there are all sorts of possibilities, and that, that's an example. Yes, and I think Leanne's point about the <coughs> meshing of the rural and the urban, I've never heard you say that before, Leanne. Mm, that was right. very powerful, I think, as the third tier is where the urban meets, meets the rural, and that engages so much with your work, Joe, as well, I thought. Yeah, yeah I think... I think I think, yeah, I think possibly there is a great deal of conservatism, as there is in in second and first year cities, but I think there's also, um, this is going to sound a little bit nostalgic perhaps, but I think there is a, an element of practicality, an element of, of, of immediacy and intimacy and the private being very present in third tier cities in a way that it's not present in second or first yeah. tier cities. Yeah. Uh, another thing I was thinking, as, as taken from what you are presenting today, was that it seemed that some of the best work, best digital work, was happening in commerce and in mm. leisure. Mm. Tourism. And tourism, tourism. And tourism leisure. Yep. And, and, and that it's working and, and, and things like that. But, but democracy is sort of running behind, and it's not working. So, so we talk about having we talk about having the technology for continuous conversations, where the communication between councils and citizens is not sort of intermittent and deliberate and self-conscious. Yes. It's continuous somehow, yes. and we're yeah. some way away from yeah. doing it. That's what I was taking from. Yes, we are. I don't know. But the yeah. Internet of Things, whether or not you believe in it, is a cliche or <coughs> not will suggest there'll be a greater fluidity. You know, digitisation will be attached to the analogue yes. and that connectivity. So like QR codes on a banana. So you want to know where that, where that banana's been grown, you want to know that it's safe and all the rest of it. You want, its, you want its origins, you can literally get your mobile phone, scan it, and you know that helps the farmer, that links production and consumption, you become a knowing consumer. And also, I wouldn't have never known about the trees if I hadn't been out on with this. Yes. Fantastic. But other questions from, from Bathurst? Joe, do you want to go? Beautiful. Um, I will, so I'm sorry if I go too. Thank you. Really interesting discussion. Um, I've got a number of questions. One of them um, is just a response to the the, um, the cases and the, and the yes. projects so far. Um, you know, physical, cultural studies. What happens if you go cultural or physical stuff? Have you gone outside of a Northern European white white culture because I keep thinking all but when you're talking I was just taken back to China mm. and and you know what's typical yes. cultural or what's cultural studies yes. of mm. cultural studies in China I mean, what yeah. how do they mobilise huge huge populations to be out Tai Chi and how do they do it? I mean, yes. We can't do it can we? How do we do it? That, yes. that's the same thing in my Third tier, it's not the first tier, but second tier, even second tier. And the, those large congregations of people doing Tai Chi, mm. that to me goes with the yes. tree. Yes. 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 yes, yes, yes. How does that, and, and yes. Peking, Shanghai, you know, that's that's big cities as well as yes. little mm. tiny yes. know, rural communities. Yes. That's, yes. that's something I'm, I'm just really interested in. Yes. The, another question, I'm sorry I'm going to have to ask you, Mark. Your, your case studies are fascinating. Um, were there any that weren't on the coast? Because you're talking about rural and... Oh, mm. Palmerston North is not... Pal- Palmy North, but also yeah. the work Stephen I did was on, the, was on the inland ring in New South Wales. Leanne tended to do the more international studies, whereas okay. we did the ring. But, yeah, yes. Palmy North... Mm. Is that, that's in, in, in yeah. geography. 
Yes. Because <laughs> um, yes. I think there's something about geography, you mm. know, about yes. the nature of the, yes. of the landscape yeah. that the is much more conducive for some places to yes. be able to, yes. to draw and build and emerge yes. than it is others. And yes. I'm, I'm, I don't know if 30 is in or 40 is in, but I'm thinking about Tamora um, in the here, which spent an enormous amount of money yeah. on trying to get people to live there. Yeah. You know, and just yeah. fabulous things like a built a lake yeah. Yeah. Um, where people could do stuff. It, you know, it's got um, uh, made an air, well, it had a, a, a history of, of air, but it's actually made huge. Um, sort of light playing competitions and, and things yes. that sort of draw people there. And then I'm thinking, what about the poor towns that have got to have Abba or Elvis? Yes. <laughs> <It's> exactly. <laughs> yeah, everybody's physically cultural, <laughs> dancing, and, and, but, you know, parts... I think, is it part of the Yes, part of the study. Yes, yes, yes. And this morning, somebody's just got Abba. Yes. Yeah. 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 Yeah